Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 718 of the Juice Box Podcast. Today, I'm going to introduce you to Lindsay. She is an adult living with type 1 diabetes. She's a nurse, and she was diagnosed right at the onset of COVID. While you're listening today, please remember that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. If you're looking for the Defining Diabetes series, the Diabetes Pro Tip series, or any of the other management-based series from the podcast, there are lists of them. On our private Facebook page, Juice Box Podcast Type 1 Diabetes. Join the page, go to the top, hit the feature tab, and up-to-date lists will be waiting for you. And don't forget that if you're a U.S. resident who has Type 1 or is the caregiver of a Type 1, you can join the registry and take the survey at t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box. When you do that, you'll be helping people living with Type 1 diabetes. As soon as you complete that survey, you'll be supporting them. You'll be supporting me and you'll be helping t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box. This episode of the juice box podcast is sponsored by us med. Get your diabetes supplies from us med by going to usmed.com forward slash juice box or calling 888-721-1514. As a matter of fact, we just received Omnipods in the mail just the other day from US Med. Omnipod, you say, Scott? Are they a sponsor of today's episode? Why, yes, they are. Omnipod.com forward slash juice box. Find out if you're eligible for a free 30-day trial of the Omnipod Dash. Links to US Med, Omnipod, and all the sponsors are available at juiceboxpodcast.com or right there in the podcast player that you're listening in right now in the show notes. And if you're not listening in a podcast player, please subscribe and follow today in your favorite audio app. Hi, I'm Lindsay. I am a type 1 diabetic. I was diagnosed March 2020, the best time for a diagnosis. Um, And I live in New Jersey. I have um, been a nurse for a a little over four years now. Um, So I was diagnosed right when COVID, about three days before lockdown started. Wow. Hey, right up on that mic, Lindsay, get a little closer. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. There you go. go. Yeah. A little closer. Keep your face towards it. You were a little dim back then, but everyone's going to hear you. Don't worry. You were diagnosed. Ooh, as it was happening. Yeah, so I I actually remember the day because it was Friday the thirteenth. So, um, I I worked as a night shift nurse at the time, mm-hmm. and um, so it was my third night shift. And I, ironically enough, I was I was pretty lucky when it came to my diagnosis. So, um, every year through my job, they have us do something called a biometric screening, which is just it's super basic blood work. It just tests your blood sugar, your cholesterol, and then they do like a blood pressure waist circumference. And if you pass three out of the five criteria, you get a discount on your insurance and that's that. (laughs) So like very, very exciting stuff. So I, I wasn't really seeing a primary because, you know, I was in my twenties. I wasn't really concerned about my health. Um, I, I lived somewhat healthy. Um, but every year I would do that because, you know, who, who wouldn't want to save money? So Um, I was at work and I was checking my email and it's like three in the morning and all they send is congratulations. You passed three out of the five criteria. And I was like, oh, what did I not pass? Yeah, Lizzie, how how old are you? I'm 26. I just turned 26 in October. You're fair to say at the age where you don't expect to only get three of the five health things checked off. Right. Exactly. So I was like, oh, I wonder what I didn't pass. And so I opened it and, and what's funny is they don't even tell you if you have a critical result, they're just like, Oh, you passed three out of the five. You're, you're good. So I checked it and my fasting blood sugar was two fifty. Oh, and obviously being a nurse, I was like, uh, what? <laughs> That's not good. I, I, my first thought was now nah, this, they made a mistake. This isn't mine. Um, but I was at work and 
I obviously knew it wasn't good. So I started panicking. Um, but it was three in the morning. I wasn't going to, where was I going to go? I wasn't going to go to the doctor then. So I just kind of stuck out the rest of the shift in that moment. The first thing I wanted to do was check my blood sugar, but the machines that we use at our job, you're not allowed to check your own blood sugar. Like you can only check patient blood sugars. So I just had to sit there. I had the power in front of me and I couldn't do it. Um, so, so once I left work, I ran to CVS, um, and just bought a cheap glucometer. And then I, and I hadn't eaten for like, I'd say like five hours at that point. And my sugar was like 250 something. So, well, the good um, news is your job doesn't discriminate against people with diabetes. Yeah. Yeah. That's for sure. You still pass so, through the protocol. They were like, yeah, this is fine. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, at that point, um, I, I think I didn't even have a primary set up at that point. My last primary was my pediatrician and I was 24 at that point. So, I wasn't going to go back there. So, well, um, I want to know like, you're, first of all, I really do want to know, did you test it in the CVS, in the car, on the sidewalk? Like, how- No, I <laughs> I brought it back to my house. Oh, you made it uh, home. I, okay. Yeah, I thought about it. But I, I went to a CVS right by my house. So um, I figured I would just grab it and just test it right at home. When you see the number, um, do you just – are you resolved? You're like, I have diabetes? Uh, I mean, I I sobbed. I, I kind of knew. So my – Aunt and my uncle on my dad's side both had type one. Mm. So there was a family history. So I I I kind of knew at that point. And also when I was at work, when um well, after I opened my email, I so I was a float nurse at the time. So I was on pediatrics and I told the nurses, I was like, I need to just I need to just go for a walk. And I had a friend who worked on critical care. So I went to visit her. And I told her the situation and one of the um, intensivists, one of the ICU doctors comes walking by. And so she grabs him and she's like, hey, uh, this is what happened. Is there anything to explain this other than what we think it is? And he kind of just he made a face like, "Mm, no, (laughs) he said, even if you ate ice cream two hours before your blood work, it should not be that high. Yeah. So. Isn't it, isn't it uh, interesting? You get to see a whole other side of doctors. Like, you know, we're all used to some doctors have great bedside manners. Some don't. But yeah, they don't try to be like that with you guys. Right. Like you're just like your coworkers talking to each other. Oh, yeah. 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 They're they don't keep anything back. They'll be brutally honest. So yeah. wow. um, he said that. And I, I think at that point, I kind of knew I just needed the finger stick to confirm it. Gotcha. OK. Wow. So, so then what happens? You go to it. Do you make a doctor's appointment? Do you? Yeah. So I was um, living with a roommate at the time. So she recommended her primary. Um, so we called their office as soon as they opened and they made an appointment for me. And um, the good thing was they do blood work right in their office. So I went in and I explained everything. And he he pretty much said, he's like, yeah, it's, it's a strong likelihood that this is type 1 diabetes. Um, but we're going to send the blood work just in case. And so he tested for the antibodies, um, and my A1C and he said, yeah, most of your blood work will probably be back on Monday, but he ended up putting a rush on the labs and he called me that night and said my A1C was 11.8. So I was like, okay, well that confirmed it. And then on Monday he told me the antibodies and the, what was it? The GAD antibody was elevated and yeah, I forget what the other one is, but you had type so. diabetes. Yeah. So yeah, do they, all right. So first of all, when you go into that doctor's appointment, do you think you're listened to better by the doctor because you're a nurse? Um, I think yes, but also I think, um, the one downside to being a nurse through all of this is they kind of expect you to know how to handle it. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were as helpful as they could be, but I pretty much from that point on figured out almost everything on my own. They kind of helped guide me a little bit, but most of my learning was, I mean, I knew the basics. I knew, okay, I need insulin um, to manage my blood sugar, but I, my understanding of nutrition was extremely limited. So that was a, a major learning curve for me. Um, but most of it was on my own learning through, I mean, honestly, your podcast was extremely helpful oh. and YouTube videos and things like that. You didn't so, have to mention the um, YouTube videos, Lindsay. You could have just stopped at the, <laughs> I mean, honestly, your podcast did, I, I mean, being a nurse, I know 
I know all the bad things that can happen when your blood sugar is not controlled in the long term. Mm -hmm. So I have been extremely regimented with my blood sugar management. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know where I was going with that. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Well, I I have a question. So you're lucky. I'll, I will save you. Okay. I want to know if you reached out to your aunt and uncle. Uh, so my uncle actually passed away a couple years ago. He, he pretty much had all of the, all of the side effects of diabetes. So he, in his twenties, he went blind. Um, he had to get, you know, toes amputated. He ended up having a stroke and kidney failure. And then he ended up passing. I want to say that was maybe six or seven years ago. How, how old but was my, he when he passed? He, he was in his sixties. Okay. Yeah. Diagnosed yeah. at what age? He was nine. Oh, nine. Around nine. Okay. All right. Yeah. 60, so then my, years. my aunt, but my aunt is doing well. She, so she's the younger sibling. She was diagnosed at seven. So with my uncle, it was kind of like, you know, they didn't know what was going on. He was kind of at the point where he almost died before he was diagnosed. Whereas with her, they recognized the symptoms right away. So I think that was probably somewhat of an advantage to her. Now, obviously she was diagnosed 50 years ago. So she's, she told me the whole transition of diabetes over the years and how it's changed. So, um, I definitely feel compared to what she went through, I do feel extremely lucky because as soon as my doctor told me about continuous glucose monitors, I was like, I need to be on that right away. I I don't think I can manage this nearly as well without it, which we all know is, is the case. So I was on the freestyle Libre first Mm -hmm. because it took a while for the insurance to kick in. So that one was cheaper because I, I had the, the cheaper insurance through my job, obviously, because I didn't think I had any health issues. So I had to wait until open enrollment to get the better insurance. And once I did that, then my Dexcom was covered. So (laughs) I was on the Libre, I want to say for like three months, and then I switched to Dexcom. Hi, Lindsay here. I'd like to upgrade, please. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, Freestyle Libre is good, but having to scan all it is really the one thing that uh, oh and oh. and having having it linked to my Apple Watch was huge for my job. Yeah, oh Lindsay, I meant your insurance, but I take your point about the CGM. Oh, but, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I, I meant I meant like uh, hi, I used to have the one uh, doctor's visit a year plan. I'd like the maybe people will get sick plan, please quickly. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I think on my old insurance, um, seeing a specialist, you had to pay it was like a hundred and something out of pocket each visit. And now it's just a forty dollar copay. Yeah. So well, you probably definitely... weren't paying anything for it. Like I remember that when I was. Oh my, yeah, you know, my early. 20s I mean, when even I had a job. even the insurance I have now. I mean, I'm I'm extremely lucky because I think because I work for a hospital, the insurance plans are pretty good. Um, but yeah, I think I was paying next to nothing for the old plan. But right. you know, and getting next to nothing probably too. So yeah, yeah, I'm sure. How, so okay. I, I went back on the calendar when you told me the date you were diagnosed. I, I, I could like see where I was, and, you know, like I yeah. knew where I was. And, and it was that time where the only person talking to me about, hey, this COVID thing is like a real problem had been my wife because of her job. She kind of is aware of like global health stuff. Right. And she kept telling me like, you know, in China, they're talking about this virus. Like she And she had been telling me about it for months. Yeah, and, and, I, you know, but here inf- it was like one of those things like somebody is like somebody lit a bomb and, and everybody was like, what was that? And, you know, suddenly we were all aware of it. it I would say inside yeah. of four, four days. Wouldn't you say it was like that quick? Yeah, yeah. So I in February, I went on a trip to Chicago with my friends. And I remember one of my friends asking, oh, should we should we wear masks on the flight? And I remember saying, nah, we'll be fine. They're saying it's just like another flu. And we, and we didn't, and I'm amazed we didn't get COVID because then, right. As soon, it's like, as soon as March hit, all of a sudden we were all talking about it. I yeah. mean, because I work in the hospital, I think we probably were talking about it in early March, mm-hmm. but even then it was, we know now that it was going on before that. It just didn't really hit the U S in terms of lockdowns until yeah. mid to end March. Right. And Lindsay, I want to remind you to keep looking right into that microphone. Okay. Um, okay. <clears throat> so do you, you don't think you had COVID? No, I mean, I can't really think of the, in the last year and a half, thankfully, or right, a year and a half, we're going on two years now. 
Um, I've probably been sick one time and I got tested and I was negative. And okay. that was like a 24 hour kind of knocked on my butt. And then the next day I was fine. Yeah. No, no. I was just wondering, do you have any other um, autoimmune issues or have you begun to look into whether or not you do? No, not that I know of. I mean, all my, all my lab works good. I, I don't really have anything else that would make me concerned. I think, um, when I was working night shift, it, it's funny. A lot of people ask me, did you have any symptoms? Cause you know, a lot of my friends are nurses, so they know yeah. the symptoms leading up to diagnosis. And one of the symptoms I definitely noticed was that maybe like the six months before diagnosis, I was tired all the time, but the thing that's tough with that is I worked night shift. So I just assumed it was that. And I, I remember telling my friends, yeah, I don't know how much longer I can keep up with night shift because I was just like on my days off. Even if I got enough sleep, I was exhausted. Did that you, was, I'm sorry. Yeah. Did no, you, no, that's okay. Did you spend Go any ahead. time as a child or as a young adult worrying that you were going to get diabetes because your aunt and uncle had it? Um, Honestly, not really. Okay. Nobody talked about I, it. I think, like, that was a possibility. Yeah, I, I think because they say it's usually a parent or a grandparent, if they have it, you're more likely, or, or a sibling, but none of my siblings have it. My parents don't have it. I My grandparents didn't have it. So I didn't think that that like secondary link, sure. I didn't think it was likely. And when you're in school, like for nursing school, they they kind of go by that old idea that people are mostly diagnosed as children. So I actually, my mom is funny. She, she always says, Oh, you gotta be careful about what you eat before the diagnosis. She's like, you gotta be careful about what you eat. Like don't eat too much sugar because diabetes runs in the family. And I said, mom, it type one runs in the family. I would have had it by now. And, and that has nothing to do with what you eat. So I remember saying like, Oh yeah, I would have had that by now. Like you get that as a kid. So, yeah, you can't get cocky in the third quarter, Lindsay. You got it. Yeah, I know. That was my mistake. <laughs> I, I really brought this upon myself. <laughs> oh, my gosh. How about now looking back at your um, other close family members? Do any of them have like thyroid, celiac, uh, no. eczema, anybody bipolar, anything like that? No. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, you guys just get the diabetes. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Fair, fair enough. What a, what a family plan you guys have there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So what's it been like? I mean, what was the, I guess my first thought would be the adjustment to the regimen, but it it occurs to me to ask you about your job too, because what was it like trying to learn how to manage while you were nursing? So I, I was lucky because, so I worked, I worked as night shift float pool at the time. I had been in that position I worked as a floor nurse for like two years and then I'd been in this float position for maybe like eight months at that point. Mm -hmm. And so I, as soon as I was diagnosed, I was like, okay, I I can't stay on night shift anymore because this is going to be something that's going to take a while for me to figure out. And it's probably not a good idea to do it on night shift. So I reached out to my manager and I explained the situation to him. So he said, but I told him, I said, you know, if I, if I switch to day shift, I'd want to have some kind of orientation because I hadn't worked day shift since I was a new grad and it is, it is a different pace and to do it in float pool where you're, you're pretty much placed wherever they need you in the hospital Mm -hmm. would have been very challenging. So he said, well, you know, COVID is happening now. It might not be a good time for somebody to take on an orientee because we were, you know, we were starting to see an uptick of COVID cases. So he said, I'm going to temporarily put you on this, the cardiac floor just until we kind of, until COVID kind of dies down and we get a handle on this. So they kept me on the cardiac floor for maybe like three months. And I ended up just really liking the people there. Um, I, I kind of told them all about the diagnosis and they were all really supportive. So I ended up deciding to just stay there. So that's where I am now. Um, So my my manager, my coworkers, they've been so helpful through all of it. So working through it and, and they've helped limit my exposure to COVID. So a lot of times like they would try not to give me the COVID patients if it was possible. So that was extremely, extremely helpful. Hmm. Um, but it, I think actually the part that was probably the most challenging was the fact that I, so I was living in a house with a roommate at the time. So I couldn't, 
see my family. Like we weren't seeing anybody. I couldn't see my family. I couldn't see my friends. Um, I had just dated, started dating my boyfriend in February. And for the first like two or three months of COVID, the only time we'd see each other was outside with masks on. So I could barely see him too. So it was really just my roommate and I, cause she was also a nurse just in isolation with each other for a couple months. And so it kind of felt like I was on my own to figure it out. And Lindsay, I have questions. Yeah. So to, to wrapped around this idea. So you were Mm -hmm. newly dating a person as you were diagnosed. Yes. How much of the diagnosis did you let him in on at that time? Oh, I, I told him the whole thing. Um, the, the day that I came home from work after checking my blood sugar, I called him freaking out about it. And the first thing he said was, see, I knew you were too sweet for your own good. Oh. I was like, I was like, now's not the time. Yeah. And he was like, I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was funny, though. But um, how long had no, you he been was... together at that point? So we actually knew each other in college um, when we were both like 19. We had been like not we hadn't really dated but we were talking for a little bit you know how how college kids do it these days um and then we kind of just drifted apart because i i got really busy with school um so now fast forward we reconnected so it was the winter like november of 2019 yeah so we had been like talking back and forth for maybe like two months and then we started hanging out and then in february we like officially started dating and then it so this happened not even a month after we started dating. All right, Lindsay, I'm going to try to be delicate here. Started hanging out. Does that mean naked? No, no. Just okay. no, no, no. Okay. No, so it then, does not. <laughs> okay. So then started dating. Does that Going mean on naked? dates. Yes. Going on dates. Okay. So started dating means naked. So in February, <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out if you guys were having sex before COVID came and I didn't want to ask it that way. No. No. Um, Oh my god, my mom is going to listen to this. Podcast. No, she won't. <laughs> uh, well, you don't listen. Your mom imagines you have sex. I'm just trying to figure out. Like, literally, what I want to know is: Are the two of you standing outside with masks on in a situation where you've been together and now you're scared to be together, or that you yes. haven't been yes. together yet and you're like, God, I guess we'll hang out because we were so close to having sex. I'll just wait to see when this COVID thing breaks. No, no, we were we were hanging out. <laughs> so before, so, okay. Now we're getting to yeah. it. Did the hanging so out was, keep happening through the COVID or did you pause it? No, we paused it Look for you responsible young people for, <laughs> for almost three months. I mean, he was, he was at home living with his family too. So, um, you know, there was, everybody was just so afraid of COVID. We were afraid of, Oh, I work in a hospital. You know, what if I bring it home and then I give it to him and then he gives it to his whole family. Um, and I, that's why I didn't see my family because I was like, what if I bring it to them? And they were talking about people being asymptomatic and spreading it. So I'm like, what if I have it? And I don't even know. Young so people was, have come um, a long way, Lindsay. I would have, at your age, <laughs> been like, it probably won't kill us, Lindsay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's how I feel now. Um, sure. I mean, we're lucky we have vaccines now. That That's an option for people. But um, no, thankfully, Lindsay, you're missing my point. I don't think COVID would have stopped me from having sex. Is what I'm no. saying. No, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I can't imagine. I have a story about mono that I can't tell on here, but um, <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure it wouldn't have stopped me. That that's all. okay, or, or at least stop me from like you know mentioning it incessantly, right. like every 35 minutes or something like that. Like, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, but that's. I do joking aside, I really did want to know what happened there. That is really, I mean, it's an exemplary thing that you guys had started a relationship and you were like, okay, well, we'll wait. But then how long do you wait? Because I mean, at some point, at some point you must've been like, oh my God, like this COVID thing's never going to end. <laughs> like, yeah, that, yeah. That's exactly what happened. We were just like, okay, are we both okay with the risk? We're okay with the risk. Okay. Cause nothing's and it was it was going into june so like we were going into the summer and they were saying you know the cases are probably going to go down in the summer so we were like okay are we willing to take the risk if if one of us gets covid yes okay let's just All right, here's my last it. weird question and then we'll move on i promise <laughs> okay. were, you, were you ever intimate and masked um 
Mm. I, that's a good question. It's a, um, do you not want to say? A, can you not remember? Um. Oh man. Well, I mean, think about it. Are you it's still been thinking over about your mom? Are you, don't think about no. it. Just answer the question. Um. Maybe once or twice. Like when we were kind of when we were close to the when we were close to the point where we were like, okay, screw this. Um, maybe once or twice, but um, if I you see. consider in, if you consider intimate, like we would we would hang out outside, we would bring a TV outside and play video games and like sit next to each other. Oh no, and I, maybe hold hands. That's not what I meant by intimate. Okay. <laughs> I know, right, I well, know, but yeah. I mean at all the right. time. Uh, okay, I'm all right. I'm good. I just wanted to understand. It's yeah, just, it was it was a very weird time to be in a new relationship. I, that, I mean, that's my point. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. You just, and so it persevered because, well, I'm, I know this has got nothing to do about diabetes, but do you think that you became more um, intellectually intertwined because what you could do was talk? Like, did it help yeah. you build a relationship? Yeah, I think so. Um, and he was really, really helpful when it came to – just like being there for me when I was trying to figure out the diabetes stuff. I think it took at least minimum a year before I started to feel like I somewhat knew what I was doing. Um, yeah, I was doing injections for maybe four months before I switched to I'm on um, Omnipod now. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was challenging. I mean, injections were challenging. The control is, is not nearly the same as the pumps in in my experience, but. So did he learn um, about diabetes along with you? Yeah. Yeah. He, he always asks questions. He has, um, the Dexcom follow on his phone. So if I'm, if I'm ever low, he'll text me and be like, Hey, you, you had a snack, right? Aww. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah. So he, he's definitely very, um, he's great. He's very helpful. Oh, Lindsay, and, are you going to marry this boy? Um, I don't know. We'll see. Mm-hmm. We've, <laughs> Whatever. It's not up to me. I mean, it is a Whoa, little up to me. It's completely say, up. To, yeah. I'm the father of a daughter. Lindsay. It is only up to you. That boy will just yeah. stand there and be lucky if you decide to stay with him. And that's that. <laughs> he that's doesn't, true. He doesn't that's get true. a say. Look at you. <laughs> your whole generation is about equality. Yeah, you're yeah. right. No. That's true. I'm what saying, Lindsay, take your power. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Do what my wife does. Just look at me in the face and acts like I'm lucky to be around her. And I go, okay. All right. Thanks. No, that's pretty yeah. much it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's, that's, that's pretty much what, what it is. Yeah. <laughs> you just didn't want to say that part out loud. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, listen to your mother, who's probably not listening anymore. It sounds like Lindsay's a, a smart, like reasonable person, um, <laughs> you know, and and I want to know about the, the nursing aspect of diabetes. So mm-hmm. if you listen to the podcast and you do, you may have heard me say that some of the type one parents who are nurses seem to have a lot of trouble giving themselves over to how diabetes actually works versus how they thought it worked from the hour that they talked about it in nursing school or the way they handle patients in hospitals. As I mentioned earlier, just the other day, a box arrived from US Med. It was full of Omnipods for my daughter Arden. I got them from US Med. Can I be honest? I switched to US Med because they became a sponsor and I wanted to understand how their process worked. But also it was an easy switch to make because the the place that I used to get Arden's diabetes supplies from was not easy to work with. And uh, they weren't really very reliable. They'd say they'd do things and then those things would never happen. But so far with US Med, nothing but blue skies. As a matter of fact, we had such a good experience with them with our Omnipods that we just switched Arden's Dexcom supplies to US Med as well. And by my request, I went through the process just the same way that you will. No special treatment. It wasn't like, hey, help the guy with the podcast out. I just went through the process just the way you guys do. Go to usmed.com forward slash juice box or call 888-721-1514. Do that to get your free benefits check. And once you know you're all good with US Med, Here's what you're going to get from them. An A-plus rating from the Better Business Bureau. They accept Medicare nationwide and over 800 private insurers. They carry everything from insulin pumps and diabetes testing supplies to the latest in CGMs like Freestyle Libre 2 and the Dexcom G6. US Med always provides 90 days worth of supplies. 
and they always give you fast and free shipping. If you want better service and better care, check out usmed.com forward slash juice box. With over 1 million diabetes customers served since 1996, US Med is the fastest growing tandem distributor nationwide. They are the number one rated distributor in Dexcom, customer satisfaction surveys, the number one distributor for Freestyle Libre Systems, number one distributor for Omnipod Dash, and on and on. Go find out. Go find out if they take your insurance. They probably do. USmed.com forward slash juice box or call 888 721 15 one four. When you head over to omnipod.com forward slash juice box, you can read the stuff at the top. There's some stuff there about me, but just skip that part. I'm not important. You want to scroll down to where you can get started. You want to scroll down right under the purple part that says want to test drive the pod. Below that, there are some orange tabs to check on. First one says check my Omnipod coverage. Here's what Omnipod says right here on the website. Before you get started on Omnipod, our team will take a close look at your insurance benefits. We'll check your coverage for both the Omnipod 5 system and Omnipod Dash, so you can see all of your options. Isn't that nice? And then there's a little thing you fill out underneath if that's what you want to do. You could also click on the tab that says Omnipod Dash 30-day free trial. The Omnipod team will check your eligibility for a free 30-day trial of the Omnipod Dash. They'll take a close look at your benefits and see what your insurance will cover after the trial is complete. And while they're at it, they'll check your coverage for the other Omnipod products. Again, so that you can have choice. Fill out a little bit of information and you're on your way. And if you still have questions, click on the tab that says talk to an Omnipod specialist. When you enter your information, one of the Omnipod specialists will call you back in 24 to 48 hours. Omnipod.com forward slash juice box. For full safety, risk information, and free trial terms and conditions, you can also visit omnipod.com forward slash juice box. Yeah, I I think experiencing it is completely different than than being on the other side, being a nurse, mm-hmm. the, the understanding of diabetes. So I work in a hospital, so we get, we get all kinds of different patients. So you're not we're doing diabetes 24 seven and we're managing it on an acute scale. So like, okay, we pretty much manage it with a sliding scale. So if your blood sugar is above a certain number, then you give insulin and we give insulin, like right when the food comes and it it's very temporary. And I'd say, almost always poorly managed. Um, but you know, most of the time patients are only there for a couple of days. So you can tell the patients that come in who are on top of their management because they'll see the numbers that they have in the hospital and they'll be like, Oh my God, that's way too high. And sometimes I tell them, I'm like, yeah, honestly, I mean, you're here for a short period of time. Like, obviously if it's really, the numbers are really high, I'll see if the doctor can adjust the insulin, but they're very hesitant to give high amounts of insulin because they're more afraid of lows than they are of highs. Like they're happy with blood sugars in the two hundreds. They'll, they don't love, but they're okay with. Yeah. But if a blood sugar is 60, give them juice. Like you need to push dextrose. I'm like, all right, relax. I've been at 60. I mean, obviously if this patient is very symptomatic, that's a different story, but a lot of times, a lot of times the patient will just be like, they're, they're fine. They'll just be sitting there and you know, all you have to do is give them a juice or a snack or something and they're fine. But other people will freak out. And I'm like, I've, I've been there so many times. So it's, there's it's no really consideration. Okay. There's no consideration for the idea that higher blood sugars impede healing. Yeah. It, it I, from my experience. Yeah. Most of the time they're okay with blood sugars. I mean, even like less than two, like 150 to 200. They're definitely, I mean, we will treat that if it's before den- before a meal, if the blood sugar is 150 to 200, we will treat it with insulin, but it's usually a very low amount. And it's usually just enough to cover that blood sugar. Um, it, it might be a different story if they were a type one diabetic and they take mealtime insulin. But again, in that case, it's like, okay, five units with meals. It's not like when you're on a pump and based on what you're eating, that's how much insulin you give yourself. 
So unless the patient is super on top of their management, which a lot of people aren't, the the blood sugars tend to sit on the high side. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, and and I think about that all the time. I'm like, I mean, I had a I had a patient one time come in whose blood sugars. He was a type one, but he was he was like 89, and his blood sugars were like three and four hundred, and they only had him on short acting insulin. And I was like, what? What are you? I'm like, this is. Right. This guy's going to die. Yeah. Is it fair to say that doctors in a hospital setting are only focused on the thing that's their responsibility? Is it? Yeah. Like- I, I think most of the time it's, you know, whatever the patient came in with, their primary focus is to treat that. And then the diabetes is like, okay, well, they have diabetes, so we need to give them this. But like our main focus is their but, primary but that, diagnosis. But that idea of, of like, well, they have diabetes, but they must have an endocrinologist or a doctor who deals with that. They're here for me. Like, you know what it reminds me of? I don't know if you ever saw, there's this video of, uh, like, a NASCAR pulls into, um, you know, the pits, and everyone's doing their job, and then the thing catches fire on the corner, but the guy on the opposite side doing the wheel never stops doing the wheel. <laughs> he's yeah, like, the wheel yeah. is my responsibility. Like, the whole thing's literally on fire, and he's like, hey, listen, I'm putting this wheel back on. <laughs> and, and, uh, <laughs> and and I think of the doctors like that, like, you know, you come in and, you know, I don't know, you have a I've, – I've, I've showed up at the hospital with a concern – that doctor mm-hmm. is then attached to the concern. They come in, the car's on fire, but they're like, I don't care. I'm here because of the broken arm. And, you know, yeah. that kind of a thing. But the problem is, is that, like, wouldn't it make sense, not that you and I are going to fix the world together, Lindsay, but wouldn't it make sense that if someone came in on insulin that they'd be assigned an endocrinologist as well to help them manage while they were there? Yeah, and most of the time they're not. Yeah, that's what I'd I say think, too. Yeah. nine times out of ten. And it's hard because usually they will, they'll consult endocrinology if either somebody's a new diabetic or like sometimes if they're poorly controlled, but most of the time they don't. And again, it just goes back to whatever the patient came in for, that's their primary focus. They're trying to treat that problem and then get them out. But, um, at what point do you think poorly controlled comes into their mind? You mean the patient or the no, doctor? The doc- like at what point does the staff say, well, we have to do something about this blood sugar? It's not in the 200s, right? Um, sometimes. sometimes it depends. Yes. If Yeah. If they're, if they're, I feel like most of the time, if they're like mid to high, mid 200s and higher, people will definitely say something. Mm-hmm. Um, if they're consistently like low 200s, then sometimes the nurse will say something. I guess it just depends on the person. Um, so if what, they're sitting like 150s to 200, then definitely not. I was gonna say, let me, let me put that. you in the position of the patient. Say you end up in the hospital. I hope that never happens to you, but like, say you do. Mm-hmm. Would you? Would the first thing you say is, hey, I have type 1 diabetes and I'll be managing my blood sugar? Yes, 100%. Okay. Um, the good thing is, is they do as long as, like, as long as I wasn't there for DKA, If I was there for some other problem, they do allow, if you're on a pump, they allow you to manage it as long as like you're doing a a decent job managing it. Mm -hmm. Um, They allow patients to wear their pumps. Um, Now pump, you have to really be, you have to really know what you're doing to be, to stay on your pump, which I obviously assume that if you're on a pump, you do, but because the nursing staff's knowledge of insulin pumps is extremely limited because most of the time we see type two diabetics and they're usually on injections. So I, before diagnosis, I did not know anything about insulin pumps. I didn't understand, you know, carbs to insulin to carb ratio. I didn't understand a basal insulin. It all makes sense. Like it's very easy to, I mean, at least the, the basal as the long acting, like Mm -hmm. how they, are kind of the same. That's pretty easy to understand, but because the hospital nurses don't really see insulin pumps that often, it's always funny. Anytime somebody comes in with a pump, now they'll they'll ask me like what they should do. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah. usually they they have no idea what to do with it. I hear you. Okay. Um is it fair to say I've had this said to me in the past by a nurse um mm-hmm. that 
a, a, a fair amount of the people you see who have diabetes who end up in care at hospitals are not people who, generally speaking, keep their blood sugar somewhere between 70 and 140 most of the time. And Yeah, then, I, I agree with that. And so does it end up being that situation sort of like, um, uh, there's a study I remember when I was younger that after 10 years of being a police officer, you start having this kind of like unconscious feeling that everyone's a criminal because the people that you deal with all day are, are breaking the law. And so even when you get mm -hmm. into your personal life, you can be like distrustful of people. And I'm wondering if that happens similarly in nursing, where if you see, you know, a hundred people with diabetes and 80 of them you know, have A1Cs that are, you know, really high and they don't appear to understand the situation if you don't start just assuming that that's what everybody's doing. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, then, and then you get somebody yeah. like you that rolls in and you'll you'll be distrustful of them. And they say, don't worry, I can take care of this. Because what what if what they really mean is I don't take care of this, just don't worry about it. You know? It is, it, it is interesting to see what pe different people's understanding of blood sugar control is because... I've met a few people with type one diabetes and to see like their goal ranges compared to mine is, and like, you know, everybody's at a different stage of their understanding of their own health and diabetes. Yeah. But I just, it's, it's so interesting to see how like different people understand blood sugar control. Um, I mean, even so my aunt, she, you know, she's been diabetic for 50 years and she told me that her endocrinologist who she's been with for a really long time says that. So she, she aims to keep her A1C between 6.5 and seven and her, I want to say her endocrinologist tells her that anything lower than that is too low. Yeah. And I tried to, ex I tried to explain to her. I said, it, yeah, if, if you're having crazy highs and lows, like spikes and drops. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Because then you're probably low all the time, but if you're in your goal range within a certain period of time, like if you're 80% in range and above and your range is like mine, mine right now is 70 to 150. Mm -hmm. I'm trying, I had it, I had it tighter than that, but I was having some issues with lows. So I, I had to loosen the reins a little bit, but um, so like, if that's your goal range and you're in range, like 85% of the time and your A1C is in the fives, then that, that is a good thing. Yeah. So I think, I think she kind of well took no note of that. Do you know earlier in the conversation I asked about other um, autoimmune issues, and you said no, my labs are all okay, and that's the first thing I thought to say then, and it wasn't the right time in the conversation. But mm -hmm. I, what I wanted to say was, in range doesn't mean okay, like with yeah. everything. So, like <clears throat> using thyroid as an example, I think in range is up to ten for TSH. But you're going to have thyroid symptoms over like 2.1. And, yeah. and it's an indicator that you need thyroid hormone to doctors who particularly understand how to manage thyroid. To like a general practitioner, they would look at it and go, well, that's in range. Because the yeah. range says, you know, I mean, look, I don't want to like, I'm not crapping on doctors. But the number's green, it's okay, is pretty much what they do when they look at a lot of those labs. Uh, you, right. You know, and so if you're... um you know, if you're thinking about your health that way, like in range instead of what's optimal, and, and I do take your point earlier, you were very careful about saying that people find themselves in different, you know, different parts of their journey on this, different parts of their understanding. Like I wouldn't want to take somebody who's had diabetes for three minutes and be like, listen, I need your blood sugar to be between 70 and 140 or you're making some giant mistake. But if you've had mm -hmm. diabetes now for a year or two or three or five or 10 or 20 and you don't understand the reality about where you keep your blood sugar, then that goes beyond, beyond um, well, some people aren't ready to hear it. And now we're saying we're not telling people the truth so that they're more comfortable in the short term. Yeah, and I, I, guess, and I think you know? that's it's important because the people who think that higher blood sugars are better are the ones who end up having those long-term complications. So yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it just kind of stands to reason. It, it's it's sort of yeah. like I was listening. I was, all right, I wasn't listening to my own podcast this morning, but an episode <laughs> came out this morning, and I flipped it on to make sure about the audio. Like I remember mm -hmm. thinking I wanted to make sure the audio was okay on this one. So when it actually popped up in my my player, I wanted to listen to it, and I kind of just jumped forward in it, 
a couple of times, and I hit on a spot where I remember this woman, lovely woman, 60 years old, had diabetes for 50 years, I think. And she just talks about, like, I don't have any complications. But she recognizes that it might be lucky that she doesn't. Right. You know what I mean? Like, because she's had it for so long and the management was the way it was back then. Mm -hmm. She could have just dumb lucked her way into the situation. And it also doesn't mean that at 65, this isn't going to start becoming a problem for her at some point. Like, it's just, I don't know what I'm saying exactly. I think we get into this (sighs) vibe of like, well, it's okay. So it's okay. So don't think about it. Yeah. You you know what I mean? And and I don't want to walk around every day being worried. But I don't know how we can, I don't know how we can leave somebody's A1C at seven and a half and tell them this is great because at least you're not low, you know, because at some point in your life, odds are it's not going to be okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, unfortunately, I think it's just a variation of how different providers approach diabetes, you know, so you have, you have to hope you have a good endocrinologist who is very aware of that and at least makes their patients aware of, you know, well, that wants to be in a fight with you. Right. Because like, even in the emergency situation, like we were talking about earlier, you know, Mm -hmm. the doctor comes in the room and, you know, they don't want your blood sugar to be 60, but they don't mind if it's 220. It's that that's a person who isn't looking to be an ally with you in this situation. They're not, they're not looking to be involved. You you know what I mean? Yeah. It, I think it's just unless when it comes to like acute care, unless if it's the primary issue, it's not at like the forefront of their mind. So, yeah. you no, know, I, I agree. I understand. I'm not, and I'm not even yeah. coming down on it. I'm, I'm trying to draw a parallel between the way people's minds work. Like, you know, if you go yeah. into your regular endo and they're accustomed to saying to people that six, five to five to seven, five is fine, then mm-hmm. they're not going to see your seven, two and do anything about it. They're going to wait until your 7-2 is 7-8 and then go, hey, you got to get a handle on this instead of right. talking about it back then with you. And and how much of that is because they don't know how to help you. And and that's yeah. that's kind of what I wanted to ask you about. Like, how did you find like, I don't know what your situation is right now. Will you tell me what your A1C is? Uh, I think my last one was 5.3. Oh. So I, I've been. Yeah, I've been in the fives since since diagnosis, I think maybe the first two A1Cs were probably more of like the, I mean, I I think generally I've had pretty good control of it, but I think in the beginning being on injections and trying to figure out the pump, I probably was having a lot more lows. And I think that that probably like, I think one of my A1Cs came back like 4.8 and my doctor was like, are you having a lot of lows? And I was like, actually yeah I pro- I, it's probably because of that right like i think so maybe the first two were probably because i was having a lot of lows now i think i have a much better handle mm-hmm. on that yeah and okay. i think and i think it's just because me knowing how detrimental high blood sugars are i was so like determined not to have blood sugar spikes that i just yeah. kept like giving myself too much insulin so now i've kind of relaxed and i'm like okay when did you find you the have- podcast um, it was a while ago. Um, I want to say it's probably, it was probably a year now, maybe a little less than a year ago. Mm-hmm. Is that in holding I, hands time? Was that around holding hand time? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, it was probably after that, but, oh, okay. um, I just, I, I think for me, I was just at a point where, you know, again, like because of the pandemic, I really wasn't seeing my friends, like even like seeing my boyfriend who's limited. Um, I wasn't seeing my family. I was figuring this out on my own. I was like, I need, I need something. I need some kind of like outlet, something to help me figure this out without losing my mind. Um, so I, I just went on podcasts, like the podcast app and just searched diabetes podcast. And yours was one of the first ones that came up and that was it. That's Screw the others. Well, there, others. I know you said there are others, but I haven't. I, I haven't don't believe that them, there so. are, but I hear what you're saying. And so, <laughs> um, no, I have to tell you that during that time, the prevailing idea amongst people who make podcasts was that, oh, I think only, you know, people get ideas in their head. Like people listen in their cars and now no one's driving to work. So I'm not going to put a bunch of effort into making podcasts because nobody will listen to them. I was like, mm-hmm. I made more. <laughs> it's like, yeah. yeah. Well, I was going to say, people are stuck in their houses. 
too, though. Yeah, like, I was like, I do. see this completely opposite. I was like, people have more time and they need content. And I was like, I think that's when I went to four a week, like during COVID. Because yeah. I, I was doing three and I was like, hmm, so many extra days that could use podcasts. And I just, you know, and it's <laughs> held up and people yeah. are still, you know, downloading. And, and so I, I just didn't see it that way. Um, so prior to the podcast is when you had the lower A1Cs, the like, and then did you find stability? Like what, I guess I'm trying to find out like what information was instantly valuable to you and then how did you build off of it? Um, I would definitely say pre-bolusing was huge because my endocrinologist did not mention pre-bolusing at all mm -hmm. um, to me. And well, so when I, the, the first day that I saw my primary after I like knew about the diabetes. So because he's a primary physician, he, he probably an adult primary, he deals more with type two. Um, I, I think most primary care physicians do. Yeah. Um, and so we were in the office and my parents came and he was telling me about like what foods I should avoid, what foods to eat. And he was like, yeah, I tend to be, I tend to be strict with my, um, management. I think you should have about 20 grams of carbs a day. Oh. And so, I, yeah, at the time I didn't know, I didn't know what that meant. I'm like, I don't know how many carbs are in food. <laughs> so then I get, I get home. You, you just look at a, a single slice of bread being 20 grams of carbs. And you're like, what the heck? That's it <laughs> for the whole day. I'm going to die. I'm not going to do it. I can't do it. So that for the first week, I, I made an appointment with a nutritionist. And the first week before that appointment, I, I think all I ate was like shrimp, chicken, broccoli. Like that was it. And I was, I think I was like depressed for that week because I was like, this, is this my life? And because they don't, you know, in nursing school, they briefly highlight nutrition as a whole. They don't really talk about it in relation to diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't know. And, and even in the hospital, I'm like, okay, we put them on a diabetic diet. I, I don't really know what that means other than like, don't give them sugar. <laughs> I'll tell so, you what, the diabetic diets in hospitals are ridiculous. My mom has been in the hospital a lot lately. My mom has type 2 that she controls with, um, you know, uh, how she eats. <clears throat> and, um, excuse me, hold on one second. <clears throat> and um, I'm, I'm in there the other day seeing my mom. She's in, like, rehab now, and she's, anyway. And so um, there's a, a, like, what it looks to be like a crawler. Like, it's a giant, like, jelly filled donut with powdered sugar on top and it was like what? and i'm like mom what is this she goes i don't know they sent it up i'm like do not eat that and she and she, <laughs> and she goes i wouldn't and i was like wait and i looked at her menu and it says diabetic and what it turns out is they pick a carb number and as long and as like you're under the carb number you can have anything on the menu yeah that that actually and it's funny even now i don't really i didn't really know what the diabetic diet meant other than like no concentrated sweets but that makes a lot of sense because like I have patients who are able to order like the bags of chocolate chip cookies. And I always, I was like, I never really looked into it. I was always like, are they sugar free cookies? Like if I my mom would have eaten that thing, whatever that was, her blood sugar would have been in the two hundreds for the rest of the day. She doesn't, uh, she's yeah. not on insulin. You, you know what I mean? And I was like, mom, do not eat that. And she's like, and she looked at me a little side eyed. Like I wasn't going to eat the whole thing, but I, I might have taken a bite of it. And <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, that that's a just another idea. So, okay, so you figured out pre-bolusing first. That was the biggest kind of thing for you. Yeah, that right. was pre-bolusing. And then, so after I talked with my nutritionist, he said 20 grams of carbs a day is BS. <laughs> There's no way that's not sustainable and that's not realistic. You can have, he said in the beginning, a goal of like 35 to 45 per meal is definitely doable. Just in the beginning while you're figuring while things you're figuring out. So that out. was, yeah. Yeah. So that was like the first like sigh of relief. And then, and then listening to your podcast and hearing all the different ways people eat and like generally you can eat what you want was also very helpful to hear. Oh, good, so it was kind of like the combination of the two. I was like, okay, I can, figure this out and yep. and how you said like it's kind of trial and error with with certain foods like okay if you want to eat a bagel 
you try dosing a certain way. And then if you have a spike or you see that in a couple hours, you have another spike, then you say, okay, this is how we have to tackle it next time. Like kind of taking mental notes of different situations yeah. and not just seeing the spike and being like, Oh, I can never have this again. Right. Yeah. And just bailing on it immediately. Like there's going to be trial and error for certain. Absolutely. And I, I don't want to start a great shrimp debate here, uh, but I'm having shrimp for lunch <laughs> and I'm excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> but that I'm an old man and you're like a, a person in the prime of your life. So I, I get what you're saying about. Like, I mean, I yeah. like shrimp, but if I had to just live on shrimp and like n- no carb foods, it that's a different story. I think I would have grown to hate it. No, no, I, I, I understand. Uh, I just made me feel bad about my lunch. I was like so excited <laughs> about my shrimp and you're like, I had to eat shrimp all the time. I was like, I was excited about my shrimp. <laughs> 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 my God. Um, okay. So. I know you're not thinking about having children yet because, you know, you're, yeah. you're young. But does it pop into your head ever? I Yeah, I've definitely thought about just in general what it's going to be like to be pregnant. Um, like I, I watched this one girl on YouTube who went through like being pregnant and like having a child. Well, I started I watched her videos like a while back, but then she just had a kid and I, I know the management's going to be so different and I'm like a little nervous, but I, I don't think it would like hold me back from wanting trying. Kids. Yeah, yeah. And you're not, yeah. do you think ever about like, Oh, what if my kids have diabetes? Um, yeah, I do sometimes, but I mean, the good thing is obviously having it. I know having it and being a nurse, I know are two, assets to mm-hmm. me like things that will help but i also know how different it's going to be it's it's i'm sure a different exp- i mean i've heard all the people on your podcast who have kids it's it's completely different when you're managing somebody else i feel like it's probably scarier because like whatever i'm doing to myself it's my own body you know mm-hmm. so if i'm giving myself a certain amount of insulin and i like sometimes i can feel I'm going low before it even comes up on my Dexcom. So I know to treat it before it reaches that point. But, you know, if you have a kid, they're they're not always telling you. Or I know kids sneak snacks and it's the opposite. So um, I know it's probably going to be a lot more challenging. But hopefully my kids don't. But if they do, I mean, it is what it is. I can't tell if your mom's going to be excited that I was like, you're too young to have kids. Or if she's going to be like, hey, <laughs> I'm working on I'm well, trying to get a grandchild here. I'm I'm the youngest of five, oh, so she's, you're, she's as got long that as then. Yeah, yeah, my my one sister's married, so um, she's first. Yeah, see, mom, <laughs> she can have. I, I asked yeah. uncomfortable questions in the beginning, but I came back around on the other side. That's I, that's right. And exactly. I made sure that Lindsay's not going to have any babies yet. She's still <laughs> building her career and figuring out if she likes this boy and all that stuff. Yeah, right? I'll I'll take a dog first oh, before yeah. I get it. God, I'd rather have a kid than a dog, but I hear what you're saying. Really? Uh, I've always wanted a dog, so that's like number one on my list, but um, it's not, not, not right dog. now. It's not the dog. It's the responsibility around the dog and that you're on the dog's right. schedule and not your schedule all of a sudden. And, and that's exactly why I don't have one right now. Yeah, yeah. Like you try to sleep in one morning and you wake up in your first panic. Like you're like, oh, I slept a little. I'm relaxed. And you have this panic thought about the dog hasn't been out and... Yeah, I'm just I you. when I graduated college, my first thought was I want a dog. Like I was thinking about getting one as soon as I graduated, <laughs> but I'm glad my voice of reason said just wait. <laughs> and now, and now I'm like, yeah, okay. I, I mean, I love dogs, but I, I don't, I don't need one right now. What is um, I mean, you're probably seeing friends again. I would imagine and stuff. It's like we're yeah. in December of 2021, um, and so while we're recording this. So what's it, what was it like kind of like, is there kind of a coming out that you do with diabetes with your friend group or did that happen kind of online and not in person? Yeah, it happened. It happened online. Like I, I told everybody around kind of around when it was happening. Um, but it was, it was tough. I mean, I feel like most people like when they're diagnosed during a normal time, can use their friends kind of as a distraction or like somebody to talk to. And like, same thing, like with family it could be with your family, but the most I could do is be with them over the phone. And even that was not really like a ton. So 
I think for me, that was probably the hardest part is those first three months, which are the hardest part of figuring out the diabetes and feeling like I didn't really have anybody to distract me or to yeah. keep me company. The whole focus was on COVID. Like everybody, you, you know, the whole healthcare heroes and everybody was like praising us for taking care of COVID patients. Like the whole focus was on COVID. And that whole so, thing's happening. And you're like, yo, my pancreas stopped working. Like, yeah, I, got, I, got I mean, it was too. Here. Yeah. It was too, it was a, just a double whammy. It was two really horrible things happening at the same time. Did you feel extra isolated, do you think? Um, yeah, I, I, I do think so. Um, most like COVID was definitely the reason for that. But yeah. um, I, I think if, if COVID wasn't happening at that time, I probably would have spent a lot more time with friends and family just to help me like get through that part, like right. figuring yeah. out, figuring out how to eat i mean having like diabetes really affects your perception on food like it's taken me a long time to feel comfortable eating what i want and even even then like i'll hesitate to eat certain things because i know what it's going to do to my blood sugar so um that was that was a challenge for me i mean it still is now like i certain foods i still i just avoid because i'm like i know i know what it's going to do to my blood sugar there's no point i have a question about that When you Mm -hmm. say, I know what it's going to do to my blood sugar, are you more concerned, more focused with your long-term health or your short-term how you feel when you think about, I don't know if this is worth eating because my blood sugar is going to go up? Uh, I'd say both. So, I mean, I've always been somewhat health conscious, like my whole life, just in terms of like eating healthy and exercise and things like that. So um, I've definitely become more health conscious since this has happened. Like I'm I definitely eat better than I used to, but, um, like my, I don't know, my insulin needs change a lot, um, over, you know, at different times. Like, and I think, uh, part of that, as you know, has to do with like being a female and having your period. Like during my period, I am much more insulin resistant than I am. Like as soon as my period's over, my needs drop instantly. So it's trying to, like I, my management with certain foods changes. So sometimes I'll avoid certain foods just because like I might not give myself enough insulin and then my sugar spikes super high or yeah. like bagels, you know, you know, tomorrow I'm, I'm Jenny and I are doing a pro tip about periods and oh. I went online and asked people questions. Their questions are a lot, you know, um, and it's interesting because so you're saying during the event itself your insulin needs are higher i think like leading up to it and then during my period yes and then right after like very shortly after my needs decrease okay. like i need less insulin okay so like the week before and the week during yeah gotcha yeah, I'd say so and is it a big drop off or a big increase depending on where you're at um so i tend to be like insulin carb ratio, I mean, estimate, I kind of like carb estimate, carb guess, I like to call it. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm usually around like a one to eight before my period, like during that like higher needs time. And then afterwards, it's more like one to 10. And my basal is usually like 0.55 to 0.6 pre-period. And then after like right now, it's 0.4. Can I ask how much you weigh? Would you tell me? Um, like 124. All right. Um, yeah, like it's just, there's so like seeing people's questions, it's, it's overwhelming. And, and I guess other things that you might not think about for women, I mean, women think about it around their periods all the time, but your digestion can slow or speed. Mm -hmm. It's not uncommon. I I got, I can't believe I'm saying this. It's not uncommon for you to have diarrhea during your period. Right. Which I'm sorry, you don't have to agree or disagree. Just listen to me talk. And and so like, and so that changes how food stays in your system and how it's impacting you once it's in there. Like there's a lot of stuff going on that you don't really think about when it's happening. Um, there's a reason for that. We're not going to dig into it now, but listen for it in the pro <laughs> tip series when Scott I will ex- definitely. Yeah, when I explain to you why you ha- sometimes have diarrhea during your period um, <laughs> and other really exciting ideas. <laughs> 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 oh my God. So 
specific. Hey, it's important. Clearly, a lot of people have questions. So, it's Lindsay, I have a something. ridiculous job is what I was just thinking. <laughs> so, you know, like I have diabetes and I want to understand my period. I'm going to go ask a guy who doesn't have diabetes what his thoughts are. <laughs> or <on> his... <laughs> <laughs> he's not a medical person. He doesn't have type one and he's not a woman. Perfect. <laughs> but, you know, but you know what? Like, I mean, if your whole life is diabetes and understanding diabetes and how it affects different people. Sometimes that's even better than just seeing a doctor, you know, because the doctors are, unless they have diabetes themselves, they're, they're coming from a clinical perspective. So again, like before I was diagnosed, being a nurse in the hospital, taking care of diabetic patients, I'm approaching blood sugars on a clinical response of sliding scales. So like, okay, your blood sugar is 205 you're on a two unit sliding scale so i'll give you four units for your blood sugar yeah and th- and that's it i'm not thinking like pre-bolus i'm not thinking any of it oh what if what if you're eating a high carb meal like do you need more insulin like i'm not thinking any of that so well yeah like, and on top of that i mean you know in the avengers movie when they're getting into a fight and the one guy's like we have a hulk i have a jenny so I mean, yeah exactly know, I'm okay. exactly yeah, yeah um but no, I just, it's it's funny because I'll put up questions like, hey, does anybody have any questions about this? Or we're going to be talking about this thing if anybody wants to throw stuff up. And people do generally, but the one about periods, man, it like <laughs> so many questions came so fast, um, it, which yeah. I think just goes to show, you know, what a need it is to talk about. Because, I mean, honestly, like no one's going to talk about it. It's just not. I mean, I will, but most people aren't going to. You know what I mean? Right. It's, just, it's not something yeah. people talk about. Um, is there anything that we haven't spoken about that you wanted to? No, I, I think we covered a lot. Okay. It was a very easy conversation. Well, to I'm have. glad. I'm very glad. You know why it was easy? And I'm going to have to bleep a lot of this out, Lindsay. It's because <laughs> I was able to control myself and not ask you if you, res- if you resorted to... Re- during COVID, you wouldn't be face to face, and uh, literally all that's going to need. I might just have to delete it, but um, <laughs> but that actually popped into my head because I thought, well, that's what I would do. <laughs> just, oh <my> God. <laughs> like, I mean, like, I mean, yeah, you're not you're not breathing on each other, so it made a lot of not sense really. to me when I was thinking about it. <laughs> like, oh and you God. have to be a little either concerned or impressed that I'm having an ancillary conversation with myself while we're talking, and I'm still involved in the conversation that you and I are having. Yeah. Not bad, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I will I will say totally unrelated to that. Go ahead. Um I going into nursing, I wasn't one of those people who was like, This is my destiny. I've always wanted to be a nurse. Like really? I I didn't really want know what I wanted to do going into college. Um, I kind of went for nursing just because I wanted to do something that was on my feet and I like I, I talk a lot and I like being around people. Interesting. So I figured that it's a good profession to go into. And then I kind of went into nursing school like well I hope I hope I like this because it's not an easy program I was like I hope I like this and I'm not putting all this work in just to hate it um but so I I obviously ended up enjoying it and but there's so many things you can do with nursing like there's so many different directions you can go so I kind of started out on like in a hospital so that I could get kind of like a broad experience to figure out like what I might want to do in the long term right and now I, I feel like so since the diagnosis and like understanding diabetes and understanding how the management is, depending on the doctor, it could be better. Um, I now I know I like I really want to go into I want to be a diabetes educator. Like I it's the first time that I'm like, OK, I, I kind of know what I want to do now. That's so awesome. that's that's one good thing that's come out of all of this is I. Well, I mean, there's been there's been good, but um, one of the one of the good things is now I kind of have a direction to go in. So that's really um, wonderful. That must have been exciting yeah. for you. I mean, honestly, if the, if you initially were going, I like to stand and talk. I'll be a nurse. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's <laughs> well. That's I I mean, I also did it that, because. Did I mean, I also did it because there's there's so many opportunities in nursing. There's so many. Like it felt with, like with there a were nursing degree. Yeah, it felt like there were so many opportunities that I would find something that I really enjoyed. Um, and I I, you know, I've met a few people since diagnosis who also have diabetes. Um, actually one of my coworkers was recently well, she was diagnosed around the same time as I was, but she has um 
the Lada diagnosis. So mm-hmm. it's it's she's kind of transitioning into the point now where she needs to be on short acting insulin. Yeah. Um. So we've kind of been talking a lot back and forth, and I I just recognize how much I enjoy talking about it with somebody who's also going through it and kind of sharing my experience and helping each other. It, like that's like the first time that I or not the first time, but it's like one of the few things within nursing that I'm like really passionate about. So no, I'm um, glad so to we'll hear see, that. No, that's we'll see I, where I go. With that. I got to be honest with you. I am paying for college right now for one person and about to start paying for it for another person. And if I found out that they had made any other decisions based on, I like standing and talking, I would have had a stroke. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, would, I would have been like, somebody better know how they're going to make money with this when it's over or daddy ain't paying for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I remember when I um, went to the open house at the college I went to and the assistant director, he's like, yeah, if you're sitting in this room, you've probably wanted to be a nurse your entire life. It's been your dream. And I was like, what? Uh-oh. I was like, am I? Uh-oh. I was like, shoot, am I making the wrong decision? Did you start looking around? Were you like, uh, is anyone else having the thoughts I'm having right now? Because- I, and and in nursing school, I'd want to say maybe half of the people there were of the same mindset as me that they they were not like this wasn't their dream. They just it, it made the most sense for them career wise. And that's why they went in into it. So I ended up being one of those tour guides in college. So whenever they do the open houses while I was there, I, after they, the admissions people would talk, I'd like be like, Hey, do you guys have any questions? Just so you know, like, that's not really true. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, it doesn't have to be your dream. A friend of mine's daughter is about your age and she's a nurse and she has been for like the last year or so been a traveling nurse. And she's yeah. basically just like a gun for hire at hospitals. And yeah, travel she, nursing is huge right now. She's They're making, making so much more bank. money and seeing the world. I think she's on her way to Hawaii soon. Like, yeah, crazy, you know. But you got to really be willing to bop around. Like, it's not, it's no. Mess. Yeah, like, it's, I was gonna yeah. say, like, I, I think every nurse has thought about that. Um, but I mean, the challenge there is you, wherever you're going, you're going somewhere that's really short staffed. So you could be going to a hospital. Like my hospital is very, very well staffed compared to other hospitals, Mm -hmm. um, the nurse ratio, nurse to patient ratio is like four to five patients, which is, is excellent. Most other hospitals on a floor like mine are probably anywhere from five to seven patients, which is, I can't, I can't even imagine seven patients. That is just horrible. So you're as a travel nurse, you're, you could potentially be walking into that. And if you're okay with that, then that's like some people, A girl I met recently who's travel nursing, she said her very first nursing job, they had seven patients. So for her, it's like anywhere else she goes is is similar or better. Mm -hmm. Whereas for me, if I was to do travel nursing from having four to five patients to seven, I think I'd be having anxiety attacks. Some of your lower basal rate has to do with your job. Uh yeah, I do. Okay. Um, that was definitely a learning curve too, because it is I mean, it, it's day by day. So some days are not too bad and you're not really moving around as much. And then some days I'm like, my, my floor is private rooms. So some days you're and there, the hallway stretches very far. Yeah. So some days I'm jogging back and forth. I think I'm the only person that jogs around because it's just the floor is so long and walking takes too long. How- so sometimes people. People will see me running by, and I'm like, it's fine. There's no emergency. No emergency. Just, I just I don't I'm want it running. to take forever for me to get there. Um, you said you wore an Apple Watch earlier. How far do you walk a day? Um, Steps. I probably hit uh, – it, it really just depends on the day. I mean, mm-hmm. I probably hit around like the normal 10,000. Okay. Um, on a, a busier day, it might be more. but Gotcha. Um, because you also spend a lot of time charting, too. So you're not on your feet the entire 12 hours. You're sometimes sitting down charting, so gotcha. or on the phone, whatever. Well, that's really interesting. I appreciate you wanting to come on and do. Why did you want to do this, by the way? Um, I don't know. I just thought being diagnosed like right when COVID happened, and being a nurse. I mean, I'm extremely fortunate that I was diagnosed after becoming a nurse. I mean, I think about any other time in my life I could have been diagnosed. I could have been diagnosed as a kid, but I I have a brother with special needs, so for my mom to have to take him his needs on and now have to figure out diabetes i just i can't imagine that the management would have been stellar i mean she even says it she's like yeah i i 
that would have been really bad. So I think about that. And then if I was diagnosed in college, you know, that is just an awful time to be diagnosed because you're in college and you want to just be normal and live your life. So the fact that I was diagnosed, not only like after becoming a nurse, but I, at that point I was a nurse for three, three years. Yeah. Yeah. A a little over three years was, was extremely helpful. Um, You're also pretty mature for your age. Do you, do people say that to you? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. But thank you. No, I mean, listen, if you took it as a compliment, then you're welcome. But um, <laughs> but I when I knew I knew how old you were and I didn't know what I was going to get today. Like, so for people who don't understand, like Lindsay sent an email and said, I'd like to be on the show. And I went, OK. And then I sent her a link. <laughs> and then six months later, she's on the show. And all I know about her is nurse diagnosed around covid. And I knew your age. Right. Yeah. And. I just interviewed somebody fairly recently who's around your age and there's nothing wrong with them. They were a great interview and everything, but you might be 40% more mature than they were. (laughs) And, and I don't mean mature. Like they weren't just like, Oh my God, like it wasn't like that. It's just life experience and the way the experience impacts the things they say and how they say it. Like, I, I, I hope everybody understands what I'm saying. Like, I'm, it's not like, I'm not denigrating the other person. Um, but you you come off like you're 33 is what I'm saying. <laughs> oh, well, that's well, I, I take that as a compliment. Well, so it thank is you. unless you don't want it to be. And then in that case, no, I no, no. That <laughs> no, I'm happy to lie about what I meant. If it well, it helps. I mean, it helps with it definitely helps with my job because um, before before masks, people used to always say I looked like I was 16 and I was too young to be a nurse. So oh, really? now now that we wear masks, less people kind of notice, how, you know, how I, I guess how I look. But right. um well, nursing is so a younger to, person's game, though, isn't it? Really? T- like, typically, yeah. Well, yeah. hospital nursing. I mean, nursing as a whole, there's there's so many other avenues you can go. Like, you can be administration. You can do mm-hmm. um, outpatient things. But in terms of working on a floor in a hospital, just because it's so high stress, high pace, like fast pace, um, it tends to be younger nurses. My mom just had a, sur- a, a pretty serious surgery, and I went to see her like two days later when they let us in. And, uh, mm-hmm. she'd been telling me on the phone the whole time, like my nurse is great. And, you know, she's been here like every day with me. And like, like I guess the, the girl's schedule was just like lined up with when my mom happened to be there, you know? And yeah. uh, I got there and she walks in the room. My mom's like, Oh, this is her. And I looked over and I'm like, that girl is 15 years old. Like, yeah. <laughs> like she was just like, yeah, yeah. I was like, what is the, right. And, and then I stood back and watched her. She was terrific, but she had the energy that I think the job needs. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it is hard to tell. It is hard to tell people's ages sometimes, though, because like I I started out as a nurse coming out of undergrad. I was 21. Like I was I was a baby. But um, some of the people that I work with, nursing is their second career. So when they start, they're like uh, anywhere from like 20 late 20s, early 30s. But in my head, because I started as a new grad, every person that's a new nurse it's like 21. So okay. then as I get to know them, like at some point they'll say how old they are. And I'm like, what? You're, yeah. you're older than me. This, I don't understand. Well, I said right to the girl, I was like, what are you 12? And she told me how old she was. So I know how old she was, but it just, yeah. you know, because she just, so she was a baby. Oh my God. Like there's nothing bad. It even happened to her yet. You know what I mean? Like her, her yeah. life looked like it was just like wrapped in a bow still. Uh, she had that fresh look in her face. You know, when you look a mother in the face, Who's had has who's had a, a you know lived through like bringing up an infant and you can see there's like a tiny bit of like desperation behind their eyes yeah. and then once they have a couple of kids you look and you realize they could kill somebody if they needed to <laughs> you, you, you know what I mean like that whole yeah. Like, like yeah this girl didn't have any of that she was just like the world's wonderful and I'm taking good care of your mom and I'm like thank you, you, you know, <laughs> like she, yeah I mean I guess it's it's new nurses are probably in most in most cases are actually some of the better nurses to have because they're very they're very attentive they ask a lot of questions like they're not going to most of the time you know you can yeah. never speak to everyone but most of the time they if they don't know something they will ask somebody um and they're very like once nurses have been there for a couple of years like sometimes you get a little burnt out and um you have the experience definitely to carry you but um i think Newer nurses shouldn't be overlooked. Like they're very, 
they're very on top of it. Yeah, their, I hear you. Their stuff. Well, Lindsay, I got to tell you, I very much enjoyed. You are a good blend for me. You have a lot of East Coast in you. I would have hung up yes. after I intimated, did you have sex with masks on? But not you. <laughs> you just kept going like it was nothing. I'm twice your age. You didn't act like it was creepy. Um, you really <laughs> held up your end of the bargain on the conversation and the information. And I, I just really appreciate it. I had a really good time talking to you. I hope you well, enjoyed it. Well, thank this. you for having me. This was very fun. Cool. I was looking forward to this. So Seriously. Um, and thank you for all that you do. I think. Um, oh, oh, is this the part where you say nice stuff about me? Let me be quiet. Yes, your heard, thousands of viewers sh- 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 would, 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 would agree with me. <laughs> thousands. Don't <laughs> insult me like that. There's so many more than thousands. Hundreds of thousands. There you millions. Go, Lindsay. Trillions. Oh, well, Lindsay, I got uh, 2021 is going to have over 2 million downloads. That's awesome. I don't know. Well, I mean, there's a there's a reason for it. I mean, everybody enjoys your podcast. And who helps? And I, and I just, I just, um, I mean, well, now that I'm going to be on this podcast, I'll get some people to listen to it. And um, the couple people that I know with diabetes, I have also um, referenced your podcast as well. So Thank you. Well, I'm I building your following. That. It's a very interesting. I find it to be a like <laughs> this is weird because now it's me talking about me. But I like the way <laughs> I I'm <laughs> I can't find a way to say this right. I don't sound like a douchebag. Hold on a second. <laughs> um, I think the podcast is set up really well. I think yeah. that there's management stuff that is also conversational and the conversational stuff is entertaining, but still about diabetes. And yeah. so you can listen to the show as if it's a podcast, but benefit yeah. your health at the same time. Or you can you can cherry pick certain episodes and literally listen to the show like it's a how to. Right. So, yeah, yeah, no, I like the balance, the balance of. Um, you know, Jenny content and informational content and then people's stories because I love to hear people's stories too. Oh, me too. First, I'd like to thank Lindsay for coming on the show and sharing her story. And I'd also like to thank US Med and Omnipod, today's sponsors of the Juice Box Podcast. Find out if you're eligible for a free 30-day trial of the Omnipod Dash at omnipod.com forward slash juice box. You want to get your diabetes supplies without a hassle? Contact US Med at 888-721-1514 or by going to usmed.com forward slash juice box. Imagine if your stuff just showed up and you didn't have to bang your head against your desk while you were talking to your diabetes supplier. Sorry, that was a flashback about an experience I had in the past. If you're enjoying the Juice Box podcast, please tell a friend about the show. If you're listening to the Juice Box podcast, please subscribe or follow in the audio app that you're listening in. If you'd like to learn more about the private Facebook group, it's called Juice Box Podcast Type 1 Diabetes. It just went over 26,000 members today. It's a great spot to listen and learn or get involved or share Whatever you need, that space is going to help you. Juicebox Podcast, Type 1 Diabetes on Facebook. It's a private group, so you're going to have to answer a couple of questions to get in. If you're enjoying the show, why not leave a five-star review in the podcast app that you listen in? Just, you know, if they if they offer you five stars, you just you light them all up. If it's 10 stars, all 10 stars, all the stars. And then what really matters a well-thought-out, clear review that allows the next person to know what to expect from the show. That would be an amazing thing for me. And of course, t1dexchange.org forward slash juicebox. Go complete the survey. It's so easy and so valuable, and it helps me so much. It helps people with type 1. It's just a great thing to do. t1dexchange.org forward slash juicebox. Let me think if there's anything else here. I always want to tell you about the series of the podcast, but I, you know, I feel like I'm reading to you. There's just so much good stuff in here. Mental wellness, diabetes pro tip, defining thyroid, defining diabetes, bold beginnings, how we eat. I can't even think of them all. There's so much content. I'm also watching a baseball game while I'm recording this. This new pitcher just came in. Just the first pitch, somebody just crushed it over the wall. You have to wonder how that makes you feel. You're like, here I am. I'm going to do it. People are, ooh, that hurts. Anyway, what was I saying? (laughs) 
Uh, what the heck was I saying? You're probably like, Scott watches a baseball game while he reads the ads? Maybe a little. Um, I mean, wait, you don't have something on while you're working? Okay. I, I felt you getting kind of judgmental there. What else do I want to tell you about? I've been, but, but I already said this stuff about the lists, about juiceboxpodcast.com. If I mentioned that great website. Um, oh, you know what I never say? At juiceboxpodcast.com, each individual um, episode has its own web page. And on that page is the transcript of that episode. So if you want to read the transcript or go back to see something, I know a lot of people love that feature, and that's available at juiceboxpodcast.com. I really should say that more frequently. I will. I'm going to remind myself. I'll be back very soon with another episode of the Juicebox Podcast. Thank you so much for listening.